Hello, Edu Magicians. Welcome to the Edu Magic Podcast with your host, Dr. Sam Fesich. Dr. Sam is a professor of education, author of Edu Magic, and a pumpkin spice latte fan. This podcast is designed for pre service teachers. Remember, friends, teaching doesn't begin at graduation, but during that first class at 8 a.m. Let's get this party started. We're Aaron and Dave Tashin, co-hosts of the Mindful Educators Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, Edumagicians, it's Sam. And before we start into this episode, I want to share with you about an amazing resource. It's called the Educator Candidate Member Portal. AAEE provides you with resources such as virtual job fairs, a job board, interview tips and prep, resume building, webinars. You can even get a copy of the Job Search Handbook digitally. So head on over to aaee.org and create your free Educator Candidate member account today. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Edu Magic Podcast. My name is Dr. Sam Fessich, and today I have with me Brittany Caldwell, who is a secondary social studies teacher, and she's also certified in special education. Before we get to her interview, I wanted to share with you a new fun thing I found online, and I just tried it out today, and I think you guys are going to enjoy it as well. So have you seen those images on social media where it says, on a scale of cat, how are you feeling today? And there's nine squares of cats showing different emotions, like the bored cat, the happy cat, this surprised cat. Or maybe you saw on a scale of, and then you saw a teacher there, on a scale of Miss Jones, how are you feeling today? As she had all kinds of pictures of herself feeling all different emotions. Well, I tried it out today. Thanks to Leah O'Brien, who posted this on her Instagram this morning. She said, on a scale of Miss B, how are you doing today? And she had nine squares of her feeling all these different emotions. But what was cool about it, she had pictures of her growing up and pictures of her as a baby and a toddler and a child and a young woman. And it showed her, you know, just growing up with all these different expressions. My favorite was the one where she looked really confused (laughs) as a toddler. It was so cute. So I was inspired So I wanted to share with you how to create one of these grids. First, you pop on over to Canva, sign in with your free educator account, and you can create this grid by looking at templates. They have lots of templates you can use, or you can just bring in nine photo frames. And then the fun part is searching through all of your pictures on Instagram, on Facebook, on downloads, wherever you have all your images, search through them all. Find nine that show different emotions and then put numbers in the top left-hand corner. Or what I did was I got a template that had six squares. I put in six images of me, six different images of myself, and then I put in there, um, one, I'm feeling hungry and I want ice cream for breakfast. Or three, I want to put my cozy socks on and just go back to bed. Or six, what? We have class today? On a scale of Dr. Fessage, how ready are you for class? And, you know, they can choose, you know, one through six. And what's really fun about it, you can get creative. These are something you can do with your students. Maybe you have a student of the day on a scale of Josh. How are you feeling today? On a scale of Connie, how excited are you for the upcoming break or whatever it might be? You can also do these as a grade level or as a school or a district or a department, which would be kind of fun on a scale of the education department. How are you doing today? And have all the, have nine different squares of your colleagues sharing different emotions. So I encourage you to head over to Canva, create a fun grid, throw some numbers on and just have fun with it and see how your students respond. It's a great way for them to get engaged, to see where they are in their, as they enter class, just to see where they are and do a little check-in. So I'm excited about that. But let's get back to Brittany's interview. So in this interview, Brittany's going to share some strategies and resources for our social studies teachers out there. So if you're a new teacher, if you're a future teacher, if you're a student teacher, and you're going to be doing something with social studies, you got to turn it up today. She has amazing resources that she's going to share out with you. So stay tuned and here we go. 
Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Edgy Magic Podcast. My name is Dr. Sam Fessich, and today I have with Brittany. I have with me Brittany Caldwell, or you might know her from Instagram, Caldwell's Classrooms. Brittany and I were able to connect over on Kappa Delta Pi's webinar, Teaching During the Age of COVID, and she presented a beautiful session about helping students with special needs learn in the online space. Brittany is a special education and U.S. history secondary teacher. Teacher. She's all about creating authentic, authentic experiences for her students. Brittany, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you so much for having me. And I aspire to do what you're doing right now, honestly. So, Oh, yay. Yeah, I saw you're a doctoral candidate. Where are you studying? What are you studying? Tell me all the things. Kennesaw State University. And it's like the, um, the doctoral program that stops you at your EDS, kind of mm-hmm. gives you your EDS and you keep going. So I'm at Kennesaw State, but I'm hoping to transfer to Georgia State to finish the rest after I graduate. Nice. So it's um, curriculum and instruction. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. We kind of jumped ahead in your teaching story, Brittany. Could you share a little bit about what brought you into education and what you're doing today in addition to pursuing your, your doctorate degree? So um, I actually thought I was going to go to law school. I was a history major (laughs) at Howard University, um, thought I wanted to go to law school. And at the end of those four years, I was just like, I cannot fathom myself being in school for three more years and not working. I was kind of like over it. Um, I didn't really know what to do with my history degree that would allow me to make money. So I started like, yeah, I started doing research and found teaching, um, found a good program at Georgia State that gave me my master's in teaching social studies, secondary education. I actually started off with first graders and realized that I hated it, right? So I was a para for first grade. That was my first, and I hated it so much. And I was like, you know, it's not the actual teaching. I think it was just, I'm not made for primary school. But um, I started teaching, student teaching, and I just fell in love with it. I just realized that it actually was my calling. And I was glad that I had not gone to law school. Um, got my master's in teaching social studies secondary. Um, and then wanted to be more marketable. So I also got my endorsement in special education. And here we are. I just started, I started off at my first school. I actually got hired. I got tired of student teaching because, you know, we don't get paid. So I saw a slot open in like the middle of the year at this school. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to apply. And then I got it. And I was there since then. And um, it was just, I just fell in love and started taking on leadership roles and teaching other teachers things that I had just learned at my program at GSU. And then I actually started my Instagram page because I wanted to share with the parents what we were doing in class. Yeah, that was the beginning of Caldwell's classroom. And then um, I was like, my kids were really into social media. So I was like, let me meet them halfway. And I would start doing that as like a reward basis, almost like if someone did really good on a test, I would post them and be like, oh, great job studying. Like they just were really into it. And then I realized that other teachers were coming to my page more. So I kind of switched it from focusing on my kids to focusing on just instruction in general. And uh, here we are. That's awesome. And you have a wonderful Instagram account. I love everything that you have on there. You're an advocate for teachers. You're in their corner supporting new teachers and supporting those um, in the education field, whether it's through their, your YouTube or the resources that you're posting. I think you do such a great job. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And it's good to know, even if I reach one person, I feel happy that and honestly, that's how I even got in um, KDP. And I wouldn't even be with you today on this podcast. Like, us speakers, we got to reach out with one another through these hashtags. I, that's, I'm a big advocate for that. Yes. Isn't it funny how, you know, one thing really does lead to another down your journey of teaching and, and learning. You grow and you you meet new people. And then that, that gives you more opportunities. I mean, it really is so cool. It is. I love it. Honestly, I really do. Now, Brittany, you taught online during COVID, and could you share some some tips, some resources for student teachers out there who 
maybe just started their their student teaching journey and they're doing hybrid or they're doing virtual uh, teaching. Now, this is something that they may not have trained for and as a college student. What are some tips that you have for those student teachers or those new teachers out there that are in the online space or that are teaching hybrid this this fall? I would say, first of all, be lenient on yourself. Let's start off with the mental health aspect of it. Be lenient on yourself and with your students and with the parents. This is a major shift for everybody. Um, the, The pressure for perfection that you are probably putting on yourself is not even the expectation at this point. So I've had to tell myself, like, calm down because it's just thinking about the shift sometimes makes makes the stress and anxiety come for students and teachers. Um, Number two, you can still do what you love to do in the classroom and format it to work at home. You know, there's no big difference. That's what I keep telling teachers. Like the internet should help your lessons, not hurt. You know, there's only more information. So things that I've done that have worked in the classroom, we have done Socratic seminars. We are still reading Zen in a circle type, but we're just in an online circle. So don't stop what you love to do. Students can still have fun. I just posted a, um, a STEM project where they, it's extra credit, but they can go and get the, I do like an introduction to Jamestown where they make a water filter to kind of like show how dirty the water was in Jamestown and different things and tools they could have used to clean the water back then before water was accessible. So instead of, usually I would do that in my class, now make the list and allow it to be extra credit for students to go get on their own. I mean, there's just, you've got to be flexible. You've got to get creative. And the one thing that I can say that virtual takes is time and organization to just reformat. Yeah, it really, I, I, I enjoy teaching online. I think it gives me, there's some affordances there and there's affordances to teaching face-to-face, but it does take time and prep to figure out, okay, how am I going to teach this in a different way using the tools that I have available to me in this online space? Now, Brittany, you mentioned the internet should help you, not hurt you. What are some tools that you have used online that have helped your lessons, helped content delivery, or helped your pedagogy online? Right now, I'm obsessed with Google Arts and Culture. (gasps) Every museum, every museum you can think of. So I'm like, yeah, go to this museum today. Like, uh huh, uh huh. Go to the World War II Museum online today. Like, there's so much fun stuff. Um, Monticello, George Washington. I actually went to Mount Vernon this summer and I was like helping the guy with the tour naturally, <laughs> like adding all the facts in. And he was like, you know what? We actually just revamped our education site because of everything that's going on. These kids can still have fun and look at different resources. Um, the internet, especially with social studies, I love they have access now to the Library of Congress. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different primary resources. Sometimes you can flip it and give children a certain content topic and then tell them to go find five resources and bring it to you. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's just all how you want to play. The internet is a vast vast. I honestly prefer, uh, um, I prefer this because when we were in school, a lot of the students would forget their Chromebooks at home mm-hmm. or there wasn't such a pressure for them to have their Chromebooks. So they would have to only utilize the textbook or print that I gave because we didn't have enough in class. But this has actually made students have to have their Chromebook, which makes it easier for you to assign things like this. I, I love that Google Arts um, and Culture Museum. You mentioned the Library of Congress. Are there any tools that you use to engage students in learning, like Pear Deck, Nearpod, anything like that? Can you give some examples? I love Nearpod. I love Snapchat. I do Kahoot like often just for um, like a formative assessment. Are you with me? I been making sure that I random like if I have a list because one issue that I feel like I faced in the beginning was students are logged on but because we are not required to see their faces really know if they're listening all the time so 
I'm big on like the random question to random person throughout class, little things like that. Um, or, you know, if it is their asynchronous time, I'll kind of just mm-hmm. randomly call and ask them about the assignment to make sure that they're doing it. Little things like that. But I love, we have a lot that the county has given us. And a lot of the times I use Active Classroom. I don't know if um, a lot of counties have access to that. AP oh. Classroom has really gone out of their way to make College Board easier through virtual. There's just a lot. There's so many applications out there right now that it's right. It's just, it's hard to say you don't really have much. Now you mentioned one tool I'm not familiar with, Active Classroom. What is that? So it's basically for social studies only, and it has embedded DBQs, um, dramatic plays that are written that the students can describe. That's something that I used in the classroom. So I would they, there was like this this one play called the Not So Conventional Constitutional Convention. <laughs> that's a lot of that's a lot to remember there, Brittany. <laughs> the Not So Constitutional Constitution Convention. <laughs> It was cool, though, because they got to, like, act it out. So basically, active classroom, yeah, it takes, and if any history teacher out there has ever or never heard of active classroom, talk to your coordinator about it in your county. It breaks down different activities for each standard of each class course that's taught, and then it automatically imports Lexiles for each children, each of the students. So the assignments are kind of, like, given to them based off of, where their Lexile is. So one may have, it just does a lot of the footwork that you want to do as far as differentiating, but it's automatic. That's really impressive. I'm going to have to share that with my future teachers. So what are some, what are some other things that you have found to be affordances for teaching in the online space? What have you found as benefits to teaching in the online space besides the resources, the access to primary documents, the virtual field trips, anything else? Um, Allowing my students to be flexible. And I feel like this is more of a real world experience. I know it's more difficult. It is more difficult. And I can say that just watching my son, it is more difficult for Mm -hmm. teachers teaching K through like three and four right now. That I cannot really touch down on. Um, But at least with my kids, they're 11th grade, 12th grade. I know that they have Mm -hmm. the basic tech technological skills to do that often to do. So I do believe that them being sure. given virtual work, I try to be a flexible teacher. So I set it up the same way that my online teachers with my college have. And I sat down during the summer and coursed out all the assignments for the semester, mm-hmm. what days they would be due, you know. So when I open the course to them, all of the work is there. And I feel like those are the benefits that we could give them and that increases student motivation because they can see what's ahead um they can feel proud of themselves getting things done early they can work on their own time kind of more flexibility versus just okay well this is your assignment and it's due they have more of a road map i feel and it allows them to hold themselves more accountable i think they feel more like adults when you're just flexible mm-hmm. um a lot of students have anxiety at school worrying about what they're wearing, worrying about a lot of different things. And I just feel like that is the benefit of teaching online. And it forces them to have that 21st century skills with working online that a lot of them would not be forced to use in the classrooms or at school all the time. Right. I love how you touched upon those 21st century learning skills, those collaboration, creative thinking and critical thinking, problem solving, all those things that they need to do in that online space. But now this kind of more this light has been um, shown on, on those skills. And Brittany, before we end our conversation today, I have one more question for you. When it comes to student mental health in the online space, how can we best support them? Um, Checking in, especially with students who are in special needs and their parents, checking in, communication, calling, being transparent. I have been very overly transparent probably with my kids about my stress levels right now with this transition. And I think it humanizes me. So they feel more comfortable saying, hey, I'm kind of struggling with this too. Um, Let them know that you're here. I call parents all the time. I mean, do you have any questions? A lot of the time, I mean, it is hard for everyone. It's really hard for everyone. And just being honest, 
I talk to them. We have like almost like a meeting in the morning before class starts. And I'm like, hey, raise your hand if you had a, a great night last night. Who wants to share a high? Okay, who's struggling? Mm. You know, who wants to ask a question? That type of thing. I think just showing that you care, even if you feel corny, you know, um, showing that you care <laughs> yes. is just a big one. Over caring, I think, is really good right now. I, I agree. I think over, I think communicating and, you know, just being there for your students outside of those class hours and not just being there to talk about academics and what's coming up, but just also just being there just to connect and say, hey, how's it going? Yeah, that's one thing I did not realize about teaching online. And now I kind of sit back and I'm like, oh, gosh, I feel so bad for those times where I emailed my professor at 11 o'clock at night, you know, because you feel like, <laughs> always have to be available. And even if you don't, yeah. even if you're like, oh, I'm not going to answer emails tonight, you're looking at it and it's haunting you. It does haunt you. I know what you mean. Let me just, you know, so it's hard to have a work-life balance as an instructor. Yes. I think. One cool thing I wanted to just throw out, even though you did not ask me about this, but um, please do. I've been thinking and working towards collaborating with other teachers and almost having our students collaborate with one another, Mm. even if they're not in the same school or county. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's really cool with just honestly meeting new people from totally different areas or like having like a, a big project and you're assigned to work with someone that you don't even know. I think that's like really 21st century too. And I'm like, you know, there's yes. times where you may be working at a corporate office in New York and you have, you get assigned to someone in LA and you're going to have to make it work, even though the hours are off and things like that. Mm-hmm. I think that that's the cool thing right now with a lot of students being virtual in different places. I think that's really cool. Is that something that you're starting to create or uh, just an idea you're throwing out there? I've been talking to a teacher in California who teaches at a predominantly Latino private school Mm -hmm. about doing that with my school, which is in Georgia, and we're predominantly African-American. And I thought it would just be really cool to kind of like just blend, blend students. Yeah, have that collaboration. That's really cool. I love that. Well, maybe we'll have to have you and the other teacher on on a future episode of the podcast and you can hear about that collaboration. I would love that. That'd be really cool. Let's connect after this. After this. So while we connect after the show about scheduling another follow-up episode, which I think we need two follow-up episodes, one on that project and one on like self-care slash time management and how to get things done. But how can people connect with you, Brittany? Because I know they're going to want to ask you questions. They're going to want to connect with you. How can they best find you online? My Instagram, Caldwell's Classroom. Perfect. And I'll make sure I put all that in the show notes. Brittany, thank you so much for your time today. I know those future student student teachers and social studies teachers out there are totally loving this episode. So thank you so much. There you have it, Edu Magicians. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. For more Edu Magic, check out sfesich.com and follow Dr. Sam on Twitter and Instagram at sfesich. Until next time, you have the Edu Magic within you.